Everybody, I'd like to introduce you to Douglas Harper, the proprietor of Edom Online, the online etymology dictionary. My goodness. Guys, an impressive thing to be. Hello. Nice to meet you all. What a, yeah, what an impressive thing to have on your yeah. business card. Do you rake in really big money? <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> no. no. The success is an utter accident. I did not set out to do any of the things it ended up doing. Really? I just lucked into it. You know, I was I was shooting at a muskrat and I hit an oil patch and up came a gusher. It was like the Beverly <laughs> Hillbillies. That is such a good reference. And I'm standing there with a look at this look on my face. What the hell just happened 20 years later? But it is great that like you've put a lot of thought and effort into making it what it is and a lot of people appreciate it and it's nice that you can support yourself through it right that's that's really cool it makes enough and you know i'm grateful to it for that it's allowed me to help other people who are researchers who don't ever get paid for anything mm -hmm. and do all this work i can now give them money to help me find things out yeah. so you know you can sort of let it i don't want to say trickle down but there's an effect to to making money online but I don't like making money. I'm just I'm just not good at it. I actually am doing this because I want to do it. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, before we eat up all our material, let, let me do the <laughs> intro and then we can have a big old all chat. Right. Less about the money stuff. Okay. Why less about the money stuff? It's super interesting though, isn't it? Yeah, I'm interested in money. It's a good word. We can explore. <laughs> oh. Oh, money. Mm, Marxist. I admonish you to stop talking about this while <laughs> I do the intro. <laughs> See? Yeah. Hello and welcome to Because Language, a show about linguistics, the science of language. My name is Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. First off, it's Ben Ainsley. Ben, what's the best etymology and why is it helicopter? It is not helicopter. Oh. I am so bored of you <laughs> being like, did you know it? the split comes before the P? <laughs> you're, um, you're, you're taking I my best line. <laughs> I my favorite etymology is one I heard just recently um, in 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 just like a really I feel almost a little bit sort of grimy because of course we're a linguistics podcast and and it was some other sort of like famous linguist person working in the media and I was just like oh no I'm supposed to be doing this cool work but it was the etymology of to steal one's thunder that tickled me immensely. Oh. That was, uh, what's your face from uh, uh, Countdown? Yeah, from um, uh, Susie. 8 out of 10. Yes, yes, yes. Countdown, yeah. Really? <laughs> yes. It's a longer etymology, so we might want to save that one okay, for a little we'll, bit later. We'll save it. It's, it's okay, a longer story. Awesome. I'll, I'm, I'm on tenterhooks. I'm stretched. Theater tech. It's a theater tech thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll be a spoiler. It's the, it's fun. it's a gr it is a great one. It is a great one because there's specifics. It's one of those you ones where, people. like, if someone told you it, you would be like, Folk etymology, a hundred percent, not yeah. a chance, and it's true. It, yeah, but and you meet real people in it, and, and they're fun. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting to you later. Second off is Hedvig Hurdegard. Hedvig, do you have a favorite etymology? Do I have a favorite etymology? Uh, it's okay if I you don't. don't. You can pick helicopter. No, I'm not going to pick helicopter. <laughs> well, ben <laughs> everything didn't want it. mine is helicopter. So now I'm on team Ben here. Um, I don't know. Oh, for um, once. I kind of like folk <laughs> etymologies, and I believe that, like, if they get ingrained enough, they almost become the etymology. So, like, a lot of kids in Sweden would say, like, hamburgers instead of hamburgers. Okay. Because you hold them with your hands. And... Psychological reality is and reality. I look forward to the day when, when that is what they're called, when I get a hamburger at McDonald's, you know? Like I like I like I like folk etymologies. I think they're really fun. I know they're not like scientific or true or real or whatever, but sometimes if you can choose if you can choose where to have fantasies, I think etymology like don't have fantasies about like how economy works or like citizenship or something. Oh, but like okay. if you have to have fantasies, I think etymology is a relatively safe space uh to have them. <laughs> I agree and disagree, but I think you're you're absolutely right. And folk etymology is kind yeah. of a put down term. What you're, the thing like hamburger 
it's actually making sense of a word that doesn't make sense in the yeah. context you're using it. That's actually how the language evolves. That's the process. The other thing you point to, which I think is really important, is, and, and you know, it was iterated elsewhere that this is or was a real the reality for somebody at some time. Yeah. When you go to the past, and if you want to understand the past, you got to put you got to accept a whole lot of that. Yeah. Because they think things that are, that we don't think. You know. We know there's nine planets. Maybe there's eight. Now I forget. Is there 10? <laughs> but we know it. Whatever it is, they thought there was seven. And the sun and the moon were two of them. They were wrong. But their definition of planet was different than ours. Yeah. You just have to, you have to mentally get into the other head and see what they're seeing to see why they're using the language that way. That's exactly how this whole process works. So you're right. You, you tap yeah. the right vein there. Nice. Well, that voice that you're hearing is our special guest for this episode, probably the only etymologist to have an XKCD cartoon about his work. <laughs> it's Douglas Harper of the Online Etymology Dictionary. Doug, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, sorry for busting in before the introduction. <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> nice to meet you. Is there is there a higher accolade than to have an XKCD comic about you? I reckon I could die a happy man knowing- Stomach. That. I am still in the 20th century. Someone had to explain to me what that was. But when I did see it, I did recognize mm -hmm. it. I have seen them, and they are extraordinarily mm -hmm. clever things. Mm -hmm. And it is a great honor as, after they pounded in my head. This is a great honor. I will say mm -hmm. this is a great honor. Yeah. It is. It actually. Is. Very good. I'm more of an onion reader myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Doug, do you have a favorite etymology example that you always go to when you're talking to crowds explaining your work? No, but I have a favorite answer to that question, which okay. I get asked a lot, which is, because, and it's true. They're all my children. They're all my children. You can't really yeah. have it. <laughs> that's it. I knew but, it. And I used, there are ones that sometimes I say, ooh, that's so good. That's got to be my favorite. But, and I forget them. The one I come back to is the word etymology itself, which I guess is, it's a natural for, I can't pick anything else really. And I did put a, you know, we, I should say, two of us worked on it, put a little more effort into that to make it sort of a showcase entry for what we're capable of doing. Mm. So I'm going to go with the word etymology itself, which is great because it's, it's, it is an absolute opposite of what we call etymology now, but it's a word for the thing itself. It's not like chemistry and alchemy where it's a, two different things. Etymology is true meaning. That's not That's what not it what does it now. It's the opposite of what it does yeah. now. It's dissecting meaning into, into particles, but and, and the, the discipline flipped over 2000 years, but they kept the name. Which is itself a historical story. Well, we're very pleased to be patrons of yours and to support your work, which, <laughs> if we're honest, we use all the time on the show. Yes. All the time. Friggin That's yeah. what it's for. <laughs> That's what it's for. I've changed my mind. I've decided that my favorite etymology is algorithm. Ooh, oh. that's a nice mm. one. Because algorithms were created by Mr. Algorithm. <laughs> Al. No. My friends called him Al. See? You think that's bullshit, but it's not. So it's, it's, it's exactly the same as silhouette. Yep. Yep. Wow. Lots of things. That's fascinating. It was, was Alcorisma or Alcorisme or something like but, that. Yeah, I'm not, I can't do that part. Most things that begin with Al are like a definite article in Arabic, like algebra. Indeed he was. Yeah, it's the Arab, it's the Arabic definite article. Yeah, it is. It's, mm. he, but like, you know, like Al yeah, Jazeera, yeah. you know, the name, it's part of people's yeah. names. So yeah, I got to incorporate There we go. It. Compare it to algebra. Yeah. This is a mailbag episode, and we usually make these things bonus episodes, but we're making this one available for everybody. If you like mailbag episodes like this one, we got a whole heap more that you can listen to if you're a patron at the listener level. That's just one benefit of being a patron. Another one is our annual mail out. It's coming. Every paid up patron gets one. And by the way, I've been getting the mailings, been making little videos about the packages that arrive at my house, the stickers and things. And so if you're a patron, update your address in Patreon so that you'll get one, you'll get our mail out. And if you're not a patron, then why not head over to patreon.com slash because lang pod. All right. We had some questions from our listeners. Doug, you ready? Yeah. Angry Balls asks, how does one decide that a source has the first time a word was written down? You can't read everything. Especially not in English. That's a good question. And it's it's the right question because people get fixated with the dates and they look at a date and they think they've seen the start of not just the word, mm -hmm. but the thing, but they haven't seen either. They've seen the first time that word was written down on a piece of parchment sheepskin that had the luck to survive 700 centuries and be found and recognized and be datable 
and be included in the corpus of books and dictionaries that that I use or that I refer to. That's not at all the same thing as the first time anyone ever used that word in English, but it's the best we can do historically, so we got to stick with it. Yeah. It's actually, modern times are astonishingly combable now thanks to digital libraries. I use newspapers.com. You can find, I can backdate everything in the old OED just using that, which wasn't around. You could, OED editors never saw an American mm-hmm. newspaper unless someone rolled it up and hit them with it. So they, they, they're, they're not going to know this stuff. And you can get it now. That's part of the reason I was able to, that's what lured me into this site was, it's like, here's an open field. Yeah. Let's go get stuff. But further back, it's not that hard. Old English, we might have, I think, fewer than a thousand actual texts mm-hmm. remaining and many of them are just copies of the same, you know, Alfred's pastoral care yeah. or something like that, that every church wanted to have. And, you know, and there's charters and it's, it's not, it's scattershot. So, and even in Middle English, we pretty much, I don't, I don't know if we might be finding more documents at some point. I think it's been pretty well combed. I think we're pretty confident that we're seeing the first time it got into writing, but there's going to be a huge gap with that and usage in almost every case, unless it's a technical Latin term. So once you cross about 1800, you're into mass media. And that's when the explosion of, and it became impossible to comb, you know, as as a human being. Machines are getting better. And I hate to say this because I I detest (laughs) this whole process of AI. But when this is one of the things it could be useful to human beings for is if you funneled Mm -hmm. all this, not the, not the, I'm talking about the past, not the present, into a siftable, you know, what these are is they're needle finders for the great haystacks out there that have yeah. been sitting there for yeah. a thousand years. Now we've got the tools and we're. this is the fun part of this work. This is why it's like Indiana Jones doing this <laughs> without the gold. Yeah, or the hat. So for Swedish etymologies, about, is it like 1522 is like a limit where you can't really go back much further because that's when things start popping up in Swedish written sources. Right. And they still look like very like Germany or like they look a bit funny. So usually if you find something to 1522, people say, oh, this was first discovered in 1522. But it's like, yeah, you can't go further back. So that has more to do with the technology of writing than with the language. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What's that limit for um, American and British English? Part of it, I mean, a lot of the Chaucer, we know when Chaucer died. We have a lot of Chaucer poems in manuscripts that we can date to 75 years after he died, but we don't have earlier ones. You presume there were the earlier ones. The the names are mentioned elsewhere. You know it existed. So, you know, I I will date that to within Chaucer's life, even if the document itself, you know, the copy of the Canterbury Tales has a 1450 date on it, which is 50 years after he's dead. So there's a, there's Mm -hmm. a, fluidity to it. Uh, you, you can also, for instance, in, in, in mm-hmm. one of the things King Alfred did in England in the 800s, he codified the law, which meant he went back and got all the old laws and gathered them in and copied them down as part of the mm-hmm. new one. Those laws are long lost. They're from like the 600s. But we have that in Alfred's, or we have a transcription of it. You know, And the words, the language is su- sufficiently different that you, th- you realize this is an older version of Old English. There are things scratched into sword hilts. There's the guy's name. Actually, it's usually the name of the guy who made it. The guy who swung the sword couldn't spell his name. But the craftsman who made it made sure he carved his name <laughs> in the bottom because he's the important guy. We don't know whose sword it was, but we know who made it. But that's it's in ruins. R-U-N-E, not ruins. Mm. And that's, that is, at that point, you, when you drift back that far, you're, you're almost not, one Old English goes back to the continent, it's not Old English anymore. So the, the, immig- the 4, 410, 450 immigration right. period, then it isolates itself from continental Germanic. Then you can start to talk about there being a separate, but it's not Old English because they're not all talking to each other. They're all over the place. And they're not even, they don't even know each other. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, not yeah. A, it's not a language. It's, it's the beginning of, you know, an isolated population evolving into a language. Hmm. So you can't put birth dates on the things. No, I like to think of, of that as like that there's like before the formation of nation states in the 1800s, most places are quite fluid and gradient. So the limit between like, I don't know, Dutch and German and uh, Swabian or something is more gradual. And then when you get the nation states, things start to homogenize within those borders. And then you get things that people refer to as language. But before then, you have much more continuous stuff. 
I'm sorry, and German is still, I mean, the, the German that you teach you in schools is not the German yeah. you speak in German. And you Let can go from you. town to town and they have a slightly different German in each place if they still talk local. It's absolutely fascinating because it's people don't realize that, that that our German that we is artificial. It's it's the Prussian military needed a language to yeah. talk to all everyone in, so we get German, but it's not what they speak. Okay, let me move on to the next one. Uh, James asks: It's often said that etymology isn't destiny. The true meaning of a word is not dictated by where it comes from, as we've said. Yet, there's also a push in some cultivated prose to let go of words or phrases that have racist origins because of those origins. What's your take on policies that avoid words because of the circumstances that generated them? I'm not a fan of that. I, I, first of all, I'm not a fan of banning words in any. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Look at look at what the white supremacists have, have just laughingly found ways about, about bans on Hitler's name. I mean, it's so, so easy to do. You go back in history. History is full of cases where you're not allowed to say this. Oh, yeah, well, then I'm going to draw a picture of that that sort of reminds you of this. You know, you can't do it. It doesn't yeah. work. B, I don't think it's it, it, if it's a movement at all, it's, it's a fear knee jerk reaction. What it is is a game. And it's a part of the game that's going on all over the Internet mm -hmm. all the time now. Can you convince people of something that's not true? Can you make something and change the world by getting people passionately involved about it? And I, you know, I get, I, I notice the trending words on the site, and I often, they're often those words, the words that are in the in the crosshairs now, like master bedroom or something like that. Mm -hmm. Not, and, you know, and first of all, mm -hmm. I can't. You know, it is entangled in the history of the people who use the word, which is, to our definition. To, at least to a progressive definition today in America, inherently racist. All words from the past are tainted by the racism of the past. A word having been used one way or another way, it sticks with it. Now, there's words like, there's the word that, that for someone who's really you know stingy, the one that sounds like the N word. Mm -hmm. Everyone realizes- I don't know which one that is. Okay, niggardly with a D, niggardly. It's an old noise. It's actually Scandinavian it's Norse, word yeah. got it in English. Yeah. But anyway, it's an old word, and you encounter it all the time, and no one thought about it. But when you say it, it can sound like the other word. And people, you know, Christopher Hitchens, among other people, said, "I, I just, I, I disagree with this, but I can't use that word anymore. It just leaves such a dead smell in the air." Mm -hmm. And that's how that's how words change. It's the sensibilities of people who don't necessarily agree with the politics. Just that, that we don't need this. We have other words. We can use other words. Let the people decide. Mm -hmm. Let the, the language isn't going to be decided by an executive board, not English. I, mean, I'll certainly no, not I was just about to say, the French would beg to differ. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and we, I, let, that's, it's great that they have that model going so we can say, thank you, not for us. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we, we do a lot of temperature taking on the show and there are words that are offensive that we try to avoid. But then there's also words that have unfortunate histories. Like I'm thinking of bulldozer. I'm surprised more people don't jump on that one. To me, that one, that smacks of slavery. I don't know what, explain, <laughs> explain why bulldozer is problematic. I don't know what it's you're talking to, it's, about. It's, it's, it's not problematic. It's just oh. it, its origin is unfortunate. Yeah. You have to go back in the family tree. It's like, it's, it, this is, is it going to be Old Testament? We're going to be tainted for seven generations. I don't know. But it's, it, it originally was okay. a dose fit for a bull. It's a beating dealt out to a particularly recalcitrant slave, basically. Oh, wow. There are talks about it being done with a bull hide or a bull whip or something like that, but it might just be the notion of a particularly intense physical effort which over several jumps of meaning ends up meaning a particular piece of mechanical equipment that moves dirt around. But we don't avoid it. Fascinating. Yeah, no, it actually comes, it's from the 1876 election in the United States That's is where it became prominent, which was a nasty election. And that was, that was the one where reconstruction collapsed. And it, it was, it's, it's all tangled, so deeply tangled. And it really, it's, uh, the end of reconstruction is almost uglier than slavery in American history. But it, it, it's it's a dirty word, I you know, but I don't you know I know if you don't know that, how can it offend? And people don't because it's become yeah, it's not yeah. inherent in the use yeah. of the word now. The, the air that comes out of my mouth with those sounds doesn't contain that. It does now because I know it. That that's the thing. Like, but if the word has those connotations and people know it and they use it with that intention, like if they use derogatory words for, for example, Jewish people or black people with the intention to hurt, you can say. That's a problematic word, but it's problematic because they're actually only if you can be sure using of their it intention. to do something. Can you be sure right? of and this is where it gets tricky because if, if I don't know that and I use it, I might even use it in a particularly flagrant way. 
it may look like I'm, you know, you, we've all done that where you, you do something, you're oh my God, I just did the exact wrong thing. and I didn't realize it. There, and you can't, uh, there is always mm-hmm. the ambivalence. Do you mean what, do you mean, you know, if, if a guy joins a hockey team and he takes Jersey number 18, is he trying to celebrate Adolf Hitler? Yeah. Or like 88 and stuff. How do you know? How would you know? I am born 1988. And my first email that I registered had like, you know, cool girl 1988 or something, 88 or something like that. And when I went online and I saw a lot of other people have 88 in their username, I was like, oh, there must be a lot of people born the same year as me. That's funny. And then like, there's a lot of them. So for the listeners who don't know, one way that Nazis get around not being able to write like Heil Hitler is to write HH, which looks a bit like 88. That is the eighth letter. So- all these other people online that I was encountering that I thought were just my age group were actually all Nazis. And it was, <laughs> I was, I was very say, confusing. That must have been <laughs> what a, a, year, wa- huh? a pretty weird period. <laughs> Got a good yeah. story out of it, yeah. though. Yep. I'm going to go on to Connie's question. <laughs> um, oftentimes, etymologies of a word are not clear at all. Rather, there are different hypotheses as to the origin of a word. And I noticed that on Edom Online, there's a lot of those going on. How does one decide, asks Connie, which hypotheses are worth mentioning in a dictionary where space is limited, even though it's online? Have you ever looked at one and just said, I'm not putting that one in there? Uh, No, because I limit myself to the sources that are listed in the sources page, which I guess I hate the fact that no one sees homepages of web sites anymore. All you see is one entry and then you're off. It explains this is cobbled from specific places. I, I, I'm, I don't use the internet mm-hmm. at all. Nothing that's on the, if it's in a book and if it's in one of the books I've listed and used and if they, when they usually agree, uh, I'd, I'd say like 90, 90 or more percent of the words, the historical part of it, they agree, not the asterisk part, not the PIE. And, and they're consistent throughout. This comes from Latin. It's, it's pretty transparent. Where they disagree, I'll note the disagreement. You know, OED says this, but you know, Century Dictionary says that, or, or Boot Khan, who's my Germanics guy. Mm-hmm. Generally, you you want to go for etymologies with the more recent sources. There's a tendency for people to write, well, you say it's this. I have this book from from 1848, and it says, and the presumption is that 1848 is closer to 1400, so it's going to be more right. But it's not. We know nothing from the 19th century. Yeah, They did the best they could. They're, they're heroic in their work, but you got to use the, the newest stuff. And some of the, the things I, was, I wouldn't put that in, they're not in the books I'm using anyway, but there's an awful lot out there. It's an academic discipline. It's, it's churning mm-hmm. itself all the time. If you're, the, if you're a senior, you know, a linguistics major, you're not going to write your thesis on agreeing with what they said in the previous generation. They overturn this PIE stuff constantly. Mm-hmm. So I don't trust that at all to be consistent 20 years from now. The historical stuff, I think, is pretty, pretty straight. It's mostly transparent. There are some there, and there are some mysteries. People do not, especially online now, cannot accept that there's sometimes not an answer we can see. We can't see all of the past. Yeah, that's so true. I am even yeah. I am guilty of going to Adam Online and just being like, "Oh man!" Like, it's, <laughs> it's, just- like, it's like a. a it's like the of unknown origin phrase is a clue to just start spewing ideas. It could be this, which is what we do with other people. And it's fun. And that's a human thing. That's a great thing. That's a game. It's you're just making a game of it. But sometimes you have to accept. There, there's a phrase. I, I half stole this and half me. Who lusts for certainty, lusts for lies. Oh, that's good. Mm, I like that a lot. You are never going to get certainty about everything or even anything at the highest degree. You got to let go of that. That's one of my favorite sayings. Um, You can have certainty or you can have wisdom, but you can't have both. I like that. Flip sides of the same coin. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you for that introduction. Thanks to our listeners for giving us those questions. Now let's get to some other questions from other listeners. You ready? Here we go. Mailbag time. Mailbag time. This one's from Aldo, who says, For some time now, it has been bothering me that I don't know the difference between the words dependence and dependency. In most cases, they seem completely interchangeable and synonymous. Today, I started to write one of these words, couldn't decide which to use, and ventured off to the Google machine, which wasn't much help. Can you help educate me? I'm utterly dependent on your knowledge. So, I guess the first thing I'm going to ask is, what's the deal with the ens and the nc suffixes? So, a sentence that I could make is like... um 
That person has a dependency on nicotine. Or would that be a dependence? Um, yeah, exactly. So that's one where I could do probably both. I think I would probably use dependency more. I don't know why. Okay. And then in language and linguistics, people talk about dependencies between words. Yep, the connections. And say like, this word is dependent on that one. They have a dependency. It's always dependency for that. I've noticed this. Uh, for me, I think, I think I'm like very strong dependency on that. I would have attributed, like just purely intuitively, the dependency in a form that isn't interchangeable with dependence is something within a structure, right? Within, within, within a thing you can map out in some way, okay. whether that is coding or linguistics or literal actual like freaking architectural drawings or something like that, whereas dependence... Um, in, in situations where it's interchangeable is when you're talking about things that like people can have and like softer, less like definitive kind of structurally organized oh. things. So like, l like an addiction can be a dependence or a dependency and that sort of thing, hmm. which makes me suspect that maybe dependence C came first and then we've kind of retroactively applied it to like softer, squishier, more human fallible regions. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Well, Doug, what do you uh -huh. got? Yeah, I think about it historically, and that the difference is that the one is closer to the Latin form of the word, and the other is closer to the French form of the word. With <laughs> dependentia, it have it would have the, the the vowel sound at the end in Latin, and the French would just lop that right off. These pairs tend to come in at different points in English's history. In the Middle English, they're getting the French form. After fifteen hundred or so, they're starting to look at classical Latin, really look at it and say, "Wait a minute, these are." We have this, it could come in by different channels. One can be popular, one can be highbrow. You end up with two forms of the same word because of our language's braided history. And then what do you do with them? So are we landing on they're mostly interchangeable? No. It, once oh. you realize there's two, then you start to, to, okay, well, we'll use this one for this and we'll use that one for that. There are cases like radiant and radiancy where, where you, you have really different directions but it's rare to get everyone to agree to do that you now you see it start out in the mm. middle ages they'll start to use this one this way and it'll either it sometimes it's completely flips because they're alike enough there's nothing inherent in the form of the word that tells you it's for that meaning and not this meaning yeah it doesn't really help you distinguish so they keep getting confused and you do end up you know and over time it will be a different split but there will be those subtleties, but they may not be the same throughout the language and they may not last more than a couple of generations. Hmm. Do you know anything about the current split? Like the things we were talking about now that like Ben said that like, oh, one is like in a system and one is like a human has one. That would not have been the way they thought in the Middle Ages. They, you know, they, I think I think it grows out of the psychological Psychological analysis changed the language a lot because you were talking about people's behavior in different terms. You had a whole different playbook for everything. So this is from the, you know, I would, I would guess that's 20, 1920s or later, maybe even 1960s, that split between, you know, physical mm -hmm. dependence versus psychological dependence. They would have done spiritual and physical in the past, but it's a way you can use two words. Mm. Yeah. And I decided to try to find out if there was any sort of pattern nowadays. So when I try to answer questions like these, I always go to the coca corpus, the corpus of contemporary American English, and I just look at the words that occur near the words that I'm looking for. So I looked for words near dependence, right. and I found these nouns, oil, alcohol, drug, abuse, fuel, government, and fossil. Those are the words that occur near dependence. Okay. <laughs> So that sounds like a relationship between two things. So like uh, Qatar is reliant on oil. Mm. It has a dependence on oil. That's the kind of thing you'd see. Oh, I've got a dependence mm -hmm. on alcohol. Then mm -hmm. I looked up dependency just to see if the word neighborhood was different. Yeah. I found just the same words in a different order. I found government, okay. welfare, yeah. oil, drug, alcohol, ratio, culture, and theory. Yeah, they're confused. It sounds like that we're we're like in pretty fuzzy interchangeable territory. Then I think okay. Here's one way to look at: it. Is it one of them's positive and one of them's negative? I depend on you. There you go. I think that's that might be what's going on. I was just going to say the same thing. I thought the first one sounded more negative. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm dependent on you. Thank you so much. I'm dependent on alcohol. I hate alcohol. 
<laughs> well, it sounds like we're saying that the words haven't really isolated themselves into different neighborhoods yet. Maybe they will in a hundred years. You know, what's interesting though is look what we just did. We we have all these sources. We have the whole internet in front of us. We sat here. We were BSing with each other. About, I bet it's this. No, I bet it's that. <laughs> that's what people do. That's the human. That's the fireside experience of being human. Yeah. You know, it's great to ha be able to know everything, but it's also great fun to try and see if you have enough in your head to figure it out. Well, thanks, Aldo, for giving us that yeah. question. This one's yeah. from Kate on our Discord. Why is tongue spelled that way? Did it used to have two syllables? I keep seeing it misspelled T-O-U-N-G-E tounge. Oh, I like the color of that couch. It looks a nice tounge. Which makes more sense, says Kate. So, what's up with tongue? Why is tongue spelled that way? Because history. This is the history of the French. language. The French trying to wrangle this sound into English and the English trying to make, as it changes. This is, I'm, can I share a screen? Do you, or do you want to share the, the Anim Online entry for tongue? Because that's probably easier than me trying to sure. barge through it. Because it's a very similar spelling to uh, long, like language. I, in yeah, French, I'd have to. Right? It, it's something happened. Long to it. tongue. It, it it didn't evolve the way it was supposed to. It it got knocked off. It's you know it, it got something got in the DNA. I must have seen an atom bomb go off or something. It came out all wrong. But it's this is the thing. This is where people say English is illogical or, or absurd or whatever. You know, the results can be, but the processes are still the right processes. They just went wrong in certain cases, which will happen. All right. So I'm looking at the entry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Old English, old English, T-U-N-G-E, which is how we ought to spell it, right? That's how we would spell yeah. That's probably how the kid in, se in mm -hmm. second grade spells it and gets, gets, gets a D. That uh, means the same thing, Proto-Germanic. You know, you're looking at basically the same, the Germanic, the German Z, that's natural. It, it all, ignore the P-I-E. Something happens in English. The second paragraph, by normal mm -hmm. evolution, it would be tongue. T-U-N-G. Right. And the O, the, we're not worried about the O, but the O mm -hmm. comes, it's a scribal trick, I think, mostly, because when you, you, you guys, did you guys did this, right? The, the U and O used to run together in the in the old scri scribal hand. So words with U-M or U-N, they turned it to O. That's how worm gets an O and come, and lots of other words get an O that way. Because if you look at yeah. like, this is the great part of my research. You look at the old manuscripts and you say, okay, I see. Yeah, there is a problem there. They had to do that or else you wouldn't be able to see it. They ran everything together so much. Anyway, <laughs> that accounts for the O. Mm -hmm. And in the 14th century, this is when they're they're looking toward Latin again. They're just now trying to get G is a tricky letter. <laughs> French does it differently than English does. Getting French and English Gs to agree, is a, it's a challenge or apparently was. They somehow wanted to get that it was not tonge, but tongue. And that's the best they could do. Oh. And even the OED like basically does a face palm over it. <laughs> but it shows you how language works. And it's not done logically. It, you, you're, the question is logical. The answer cannot be logical because it's the mass hive mind working, not even working. It just sounds are tumbling out of its mouth. And then someone has to try and figure out what letter goes with that sound. And also, if you were to transcribe things into letters 100%, like that one sound is always spelled the same way, uh, and etc., then what do you do when you get language change? So you write down how it's spelled at one point in time, and then that's pronounced differently over time, and then your spelling has to catch up. But that's very hard to do to like... So the way I think about it is that a lot of... Um, the writing systems that is the most transparent, as it's called, where like the letters and the and the sounds uh, have like almost a one to one correspondence. Those are often the most recent uh. writing systems. So, like Turkish, for example, is like relatively recent. So they have fossilized. However, Turkish was spoken in, and I'm going to forget the exact year, but it's in within the last hundred years when they changed the writing system. 1920, I think. 1920, 22, 23. Yeah, something like that. Right. Spelling is a modern invention. Shakespeare never misspelled anything. He couldn't. There wasn't a spelling. Uh, most of the most of the time I'm dealing with English, it's pre-spelling. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point too. So these kind of niggling tricks that happens. That's modern, that, and it has nothing to do with the organic language. Yeah, the organic. The mouth doesn't care how you spell it. <laughs> and also, in, sometimes in old writings, you can get the same sound or word spelled differently in the same text. Yeah. So one person is writing a letter to someone else, and they're just like, well, I feel like putting an H in here, but I'm not going to do it later because, like, 
I forgot about it. And it's also, it's a real clue to linguistics because they're trying to write it. They actually are trying to, in many cases, wrestle the etymology and the phonetics into one word. And you can see like the, you can actually picture the scribe yeah. sitting there with a pen thinking, wait a minute, does this have a U in it or not? You know, it's like in a moment in history that comes through in that one letter. And they're just doing this on the fly and trying to make it work. And we're stuck with the results. Thanks, Nikkei, for that question. This next one's from Bill via email, who says, I had some sitcom on, and a character was doing a vocal exercise. A proper cup of coffee in a copper coffee cup. Let's all say it together. A proper a cup proper of coffee, coffee in a coffee copper in coffee, coffee, in coffee cup. Coffee well done, team. That was horrible. <laughs> Later in the day, says Bill, I realized I was having trouble saying it in my head, making the same goofs I'd make if I were trying to say it out loud quickly, a copper proper copy cup of oh. all those. But why? I nice. guess even though I knew that the challenge of a tongue twister like is this. not that it actually twists your tongue, I did assume that the difficulty of reciting one was physiological. It's not like I have any trouble typing it correctly after all. I just double checked. Thanks, Bill. P.S. My wife has pointed out that maybe this is just me since I'm prone to incidents of aphasia for migraine related reasons. Whoops. So I guess the first question is, do you, all of us, do we have trouble um, saying tongue twisters in our head? Does it come out wrong? Let's just try one now. I'm having trouble the longer they are because my short-term memory is struggling to <laughs> yeah. remember what it is. Well, what about Unique New York? That's short. <sighs> yeah, I don't have a problem with that in my head. That's a little bit tricky, but I am also prone to migraines. And sometimes have longer word retrieval. But I also have a tendency when I type to do phonological things. So like um, if there's an M that comes before a D, I'll write N instead. So I'll like do phonological processes, but with my hands, which doesn't make any sense unless I am, my phonological brain is engaging like more than it quote unquote should. Sounds like what you're talking about is that whatever's going on with language is also going on with our brains. Is your you have an inner narrative? Oh, well. You hear, you know, you narr I do. Uh, as I'm, lo I'm looking, and there's sort of like a sportscaster or something in my head saying this is happening. But y your thoughts form in words. Some people, but some people don't, right? Yeah, so I always wonder. Does everyone? I mean, this really isn't. I don't. This is not my. This is Chomsky territory. I don't do this. This is psychology of language. But it is, it is an interesting question because I find that. I found that doing that, if I the more I did it, the easier it got to do it without any stumbling in my head. If you say it over and over in your head, it gets fixed there. And you're right, the brain shouldn't tangle over things that only involve the tongue. There should be no brain difference. But I think, I mean, I know that psychologists nowadays don't really believe in this like mirror neuron theory that like when we engage different parts of the brain, we actually pretend that we're doing the motor things as well. So if, if we look at someone who's like jumping, that part of our brain is like, I'm going to simulate jumping like a dog and, it's and like <laughs> do little jumping things. When did we stop believing in that? I thought that was still. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this way? I thought they stopped believing in that. We kind of don't. I haven't seen it talked about much. I haven't seen an express. We need a psychologist for this. But I, it's true. I haven't seen it for about 10 years. That's for sure. This might be the next multiple intelligences. Mm, or mirror. No longer cool. No longer cool. That is true. <laughs> well, what? let me get to some work that I found while we're looking at mirror neurons. This one is from Dr. Christopher Bouchal from the University of California and a team published in Nature way back in 2013. In this paper, they looked at three people, N of three, with epilepsy. Now, these people's brains were rigged up with electrodes because they were undergoing pre-surgical electrophysiological sessions. They got these people to say some syllables and then took a look at what was happening in their motor cortex just to see if there were any patterns. They found some pretty interesting patterns. They found that there was a lot of overlap in the places that were doing the work. They saw that there were front of the tongue sounds like s and sh, there were back of the tongue sounds like g, and then there were lip sounds. They also found that the vowel sounds were a little bit different in the brain depending on whether your lips were rounded or not. Co-author Dr. Edward Chang says this implies that tongue twisters are hard because their representations in the brain greatly overlap. 
So for our discussion, what this means is that what's going on in the mouth is very similar to what's going on in the brain, which would imply that it shouldn't be surprising that you can't really think tongue twisters any easier than you can say them. But does that mean that people who don't have an internal monologue, which some people say that they don't, I still don't understand. I find it very hard to assess, A, if I really do, because I don't like hear a voice, but I think there are words. I don't know how to explain it. But um, I want to know, like, people who say that they definitely hear nothing and also maybe see nothing inside their minds, quote unquote, do they then have an easier time thinking about tongue twisters? Sounds like we found a new research area. <laughs> I had a deaf friend once and tried to ask that question, but didn't even know how to frame it in a way that she understood what I was looking for. I think that would be where you'd find out. What did deaf people do? Mm. I bet there are, quote unquote, tongue twisters in sign languages, right? Like combinations yeah. that are hard to yeah. get to quickly or yeah. that are very similar to each other. So you have to like really make sure that you do them differently. That would make sense. That would make sense. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I mutation is basically the same thing on a, on a mass scale. I mutation? I mutation. Mice instead of mouses. Oh, ah. like that. It's a mouth trick. Yeah, it's it's supposedly it's because you 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 you're you're too lazy to jump to one sound and then back to the same, you know. It, it's explain it's explicable, right? It's yeah, explicable it's like through harmony. basically mouth laziness, as I call it. But that's the same process. Effectiveness <laughs> is how I as a yeah, self-identified yeah, yeah. lazy person. You guys are too easy on the mouth. <laughs> Thanks, Bill, for that question. Related or not. There's our Related or Not theme song by Hugh. Thanks, Hugh, for that. It's time to play Related or Not, the game that we were born to play with this oh, man. What? What? How? <laughs> oh, hang on. Hang on. How can we play this game with Doug? Like, this is like putting me in a ring with, like, a Mike Tyson in his prime, man, and I'm just <laughs> pudgy old me being like, yeah. um, oh, geez, Mr. Tyson, you sure is not, ow. Hey, your shoe's untied. Yeah. Uh, I could score a point off Serena Williams. Doug, what's your comment on that? I, you know, it's funny. I've been doing this. This is the natural game. If, you, if you're on this topic, I used to put it on a blog I had back in 2003 or something. I get to feel queasy about it because it implies first a binary answer. And the answer is often, as we all know, we don't know, or maybe yes, maybe no, or we know this one, but we don't know that one. There's like five possible logical iterations of an answer to that question. And it also, I've become really, really you know, concerned about people not understanding the difference between the historical etymology and the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European mud hole, mm -hmm. which is where mud they- which is, like Those are very different. Like the one we were talking about before, flower and flower. There's a question, is identical the same as related? I guess it is. But their clean historical evidence trail says yes. And, you know, like it, you, you can look at the divergence of form as you go back in time. But once you hit that ground level and you're into asterisk territory, everything is uncertain. It is impossible to have a certain answer. It is just not intellectually honest to say it's the same material you're working. It's not the same material, but there is such a thing as things that historical linguists still are more sure about than others. Yeah. So if they see like a regular pattern again and again in lots and lots of different words between two languages, and they see something similar for this pair, and the meanings are somewhat similar, right. like, I don't know, a pot and a bucket, you could be like, well, it it seems very reasonable, but you're right. They can never be 100% certain. Yeah, Grimm's Law is real. Grimm's Law is real. Grimm's Law works. It, it's, it's, it's all, yeah. but they, first of all, the, the PIE answers, since I've been doing this, have changed enormously. I was using the old Watkins book from 1999, the second American Heritage Edition. And by the time I'm picking up these Leiden books, 2007, 2008, the answers are all not, I don't know if the answers are different. These guys are giving different answers. And you start to see the pattern mm -hmm. of what they're doing. They're looking back and saying, wait a minute, you've taken every modern Indo European per your word and tried to find a PIE root. What if they got the words from the people who were there before the proto? -root? So that's yeah. now the tennis, which is probably wise, probably good, but it throws everything in turmoil again. And once again, everything's uncertain. Wait, did you say that's now the tennis? Tendance. 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 Okay. Oh, I thought you meant tendency. <laughs> okay. Probably. 
did. I probably just <laughs> lazy mouth, you know. It happens. Yeah, there you go. Ben, you don't have to worry because Doug is going to bring us some words. Ah. Uh, Mike Tyson is officiating okay. the fight. That makes way more sense. He's the ref. That's the only fair thing. Who's got more money? Who's got more money? I'm out of work, you know. I'll take bribes. <laughs> I, I actually had – I was going to do this on my own. I can't share it with you because I, I made a little video. But is a stepladder like a stepsister? Ooh. I think an old carpenter joke. This is my stepladder. I never knew my real ladder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to recuse myself because I think I know this one. We talked about this. <laughs> I am going with not related. Okay. Any reason for that feel? I think that um, the step in step parent or whatever is likely to be a lot older than the step in step ladder and i'm also just struggling to understand how i don't know the, the conceptual link between a step on a ladder and the step in step sibling or step parent or what have you somebody stepped out and then the step parent stepped in oh uh, i guess or you're so. a step lower than the regular <laughs> oh okay a step know, higher I, yeah I'm still I'm still hmm. going with no. Okay. I just okay. I'm, we're making oh, stuff we up now. We're making stuff up. <laughs> Maybe it's because you have to kneel down in front of the carriage while the real person steps on you to mount it, so you're the steps. <laughs> yeah, okay. Headers, what do you reckon? Uh, I have a couple of thoughts. So the only languages that I know this words in is, is is Swedish, where the word is uh, some it's related to stiff, stiv. So it's stiff father, stiff sister, etc. Uh, or sometimes nowadays uh, people say bonus. I like that. Um, I have a, a bonus, bonus dad. Mom. I have a bonus uh, sister. That's good. Or uh, they also used to be pretend or um, plastic. I have a plastic oh, sister. Oh, no. Um, like not real. Oh, dear. Uh, but I think bonus is getting more common. Like if you marry someone who already has kids, you say, I, I have bonus kids. Uh, which nice. is nice. Uh, but, uh, so now I'm trying to think of, like, step, but I do think that it is the, uh, like, one step away from a real, a quote-unquote full sister. I think that that is the step, so I think it's the same step, so I'm going to say they are related. Okay. All right. Doug, hit us. That's the best guess. I, if I was going to, if I didn't know, I'd say that's a good guess. Um, you want me to read through the answer then, or? Sure, just do what you do. All right. Rip off the band-aid. Tell me Who's if right? I won. Uh, you, you won my vote for the best wrong answer. The, <laughs> the, 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 the question we're really asking is, are the steps in both of them thought to be from the, at some point in the past from the same root word? The form it is, of it isn't much help because it's not like one where you can trace it back and they start to look different the further back you go. Step ladder, that only is from 17th, 18th century or so. It, it, it takes you back to the verb step. The Middle English, it's Old English, straight Germanic, exactly what we use it for now. Take a step, move the legs and feet. And it's consistent throughout Germanic, stop Finn in German. And then you go, at PIE, it sort of disappears in the mud. But when you switch over to the other step, it, it actually, it was a word of its own in Old English. It had a, a verb, a stiepan, bestiepan, bereave, deprive of parents or children. Oh. And the original connotation is presumed to be of loss. And it goes on back into into this there. Again, you're back into guest country with PIE. But it's the, the sense of it is moving is transparently not about stepping. So I think it's safe uh -huh. to say with reasonable certainty, these are not going to prove to be related if we could see the whole picture. So a step parent is a okay. bereavement parent. It involves a loss. There is a loss at some point in the story. And this is an element of what creates this new relationship. All right. One for Ben. I'm hearing that I got that 100% correct in every way. Oh, so Orphan. Orphan is orphan is a similar thing. Orphan has an idea of passing. You know, everyone was responsible. Someone was responsible for everyone in old communities. And if you didn't have mm -hmm. parents, you were a problem because what do we get? No one's responsible for this. Kid. So you, they were yeah. very careful to maintain, you know, some sense of who's in charge of this one. And th these relationships mm -hmm. mattered in, in a, in a, community trying to survive hmm. it's funny because you're st right you're standing back in you know the, beyond that you're pre-roman so it's a stepfather then a bit similar to a widower in a way there, that you're assuming that they've lost their wife and or kids something yeah 
Yeah. It, they, and they are now quickly as quickly as possible have to join up to another yeah, unit. Ch- Chuckle themselves <laughs> to a fresh victim. Pretty much for food. Someone who will save you from the wolves. Uh, if you look at Orphan, the entry for Orphan does that too. It's a, it basically was a child bereaved of both parents, and it is apparently, you know, comes from from a word that has to do with deprived of status, bereft of, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. a, a separation and loss word. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, that's one for Ben. Let's go to our next one. Have you got another one for us, Doug? Well, let's see. I've won that. I hit this lately. I've been editing the, the unwords, which is a nightmare. I'll tell you about that. It's, it's hallucinogenic because it's the entire dictionary with the word un stuck in front of it. So I'm doing the same job. And it gets surreal. And then you hit ungood and you realize that's what it is. This is about making things the, you know, all those old English words like, like unglad for miserable and unjoyous for, it's coming, that's, this is 1984. Ah, you freak out in the middle. This is where you freak out in un. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Double plus ungood. Why do we need the word bad? Bad is a negative word. It's a bad sounding word. We have the word good. That's all we need. You just make ungood. Who needs bad? Yeah. Double plus Double ungood. Double plus ungood. Right. And then we're in hell. Well, we'll be there in a week. So, um, <laughs> so but what I came across, and it surprised me because I'd forgotten it, was un- ungainly. You know the word ungainly. Yeah, kind of gawky. Yes. Me and technology is ungainly. Okay. A newborn horse. Yes. <laughs> like, it seems to involve having long, thin limbs. <laughs> it, as, we, as we use. Is that true? It, it's changed. But- is it related to again or gain? <laughs> Sorry, you said y- y- you meant the word again. Like I'm gonna have another coffee. I'm gonna have coffee again. I really thought you were gonna tie it to gain. Okay, we're talking about again. Gain is Latin, right? That's that's so funny because uh, I I when we do this game, I always write down what the words are, and I was trying to. Spell ungainly, and I was like, I'm not sure about this. That's a good sign. But I did put in gain like the same way as again. I did spell it like that. Now, a uh, in like Greek and stuff like that is also like uh, opposite. So like, um, hang on, you're 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 giving us you're giving us all the answers before we put our answers in. <laughs> well, I, I, but I don't know if this a uh, is okay. that mm-hmm. right. So. I feel like you're engaging in uh, psychological warfare. You just, you just, you're throwing little bits and pieces out here to just leave us all like separate oh, corners, oh. separate corners. Tyson <laughs> breaks in. <laughs> this is why my my husband likes to be on the same team as me when we play board games. Because when we play games like um, what's that one called, Code Names, I will like actively try and psych the other people out by like pretending that I'm helping them to guess. <laughs> you're a monster, so is I'm what like- you're saying. <laughs> 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 so, I want to hear Daniel. Daniel, I want Daniel Daniel to put his money on the table. My yeah. thinking is that the first thing I thought of was, hang on, what's the relationship between gain and again? And I suppose that I think that those two are related. You do something to the benefit. You do something, you know, so that there's more of something. There's more coffee. I gained a coffee. I had it again. But ungainly, not, my first instinct is not. It's just like two consonants and a vowel or two vowels gain anything could come to resemble that over a few centuries so i'm gonna say no i reckon yes (laughs) and i reckon yes because not because they're directly related like i don't think one is necessarily the opposite of the other but i'm wondering if the gain unit is is the linkage here and in some way ungainly once meant to literally like maybe to lose stuff to be to be a forgetful or a um a, like a bit of a space cadet or something like that like a person would be ungainly if they were always walking around being like oh no where's where have i put my pocket watch and all that sort of stuff um and so then like you were saying daniel a gain could be related to gain so i reckon there's a connection there all right Hedvig, what's your answer I think the gain uh, path is a red herring. I don't think that's okay, but, related. But just um, and I'm thinking it's. Uh, I'm gonna guess that it has something to do with walking, and that the gain thing has to do with walking, like go gone, uh, and that they that's are good. related. 
and that the un and a uh are somehow. I don't I don't I don't mm-hmm. know the nitty mm-hmm. gritty, mm-hmm. but that's mm-hmm. all I have. So I like related. It. Okay, I'm the only one that's unrelated. Ben and Hibbig think related. What's the answer, Doug? Because we know that there are certainties in etymology. Apparently, well, they are related. God damn it. It's the same gain. And apparently they're unrelated to the gain uh, that has, you know, get advantage, <laughs> which is from a hunting, hunting brute. Absolute oh, thing. damn it. Does this mean Hedwig is more right than I was? That sucks. Well, this is going to, the paths are, are unexpected because this is one that has changed meaning. We have it as the awkward, clumsy, ungainly. That's a 17th century modification. In Middle English, it was more like unfit, improper, you know, you're, you're physically improper when you're ungainly, but it was a more general thing. And really... The verb ungain, or not ungain, the, the, the form of the adjective ungain was inconvenient, disagreeable, troublesome. Okay. It's not, it's something that is not gain. So you have this G E I N in Middle English, kind, helpful, reliable, beneficial. <laughs> and it, that is one of the old, that is one of the Viking words that got into English. It's, it's a, it's a oh gain. Oh my God, I know yes. it. Yes. Old Norse gegen, straight, direct, helpful, proto Germanic root. Again is that word gain in with the the prefix on it. Oh. It's so it's it's something towards. It's something that's that is on toward is on gegen. And in in German, it's still gegen for like uh, yeah, like together. if right. you are uh, anti-vax, for example, you are gegen vaccination. Right. Yes. Against. Yeah. Well, against and again are the same word. Far out. They just differentiate. That's a good one. Yeah, and that's why it has the hard G. That's the Norse. That was that was a sign. The, the, the German. <laughs> Good job, you two. So pleased. I'm 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 going to think that um, I would just like to remind Hedvig that I am on two points and that she is on one. <laughs> I'm keeping. <laughs> You're not supposed to. I'm also keeping track. He's shooting the moon. And then there's this one from Anne and Diego. Anne asks, "This is for all three of you. Why are we bedridden when we are sick?" All the other ridden suffixes seem to mean beset by, like guilt-ridden or pest-ridden. Then Diego chimed in on Discord. And is this ridden related to riddled, as in riddled with bullets? In which case, I guess bed-ridden would be like full of bed because you have to rest and can't get out of bed. So here's my question. I got three. Rid, like get rid of. Ridden, as in bed-ridden or guilt-ridden. And riddled. With. Hmm. Rid, ridden, and riddled. <laughs> Do you think any of these are related? And I'll give you my guess first. I said that riddle is the odd one out, but rid and ridden are the related ones. Can I add the fourth one? Like, uh, I have ridden a horse. Okay. Well, let's explore that then. Do you think that riding comes into this at all? Hedvig. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna. I want all four in there because otherwise it feels empty. You feels can't like do four. <laughs> I create. I created a conceptual linkage in my head, and now if I don't include it, everything's wrong. Everyone must now have this linkage. Yes, yes Epic. If you got a six, everything's related to everything else. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, Doug. Okay. No, I'm gonna ask Doug last, but Ben, I'm going to you. I reckon I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, be discordant with Daniel, which is always just a really winning strategy in this game. Well, it has been so far. You're doing a crack and drag <laughs> job so far. I think riddled and ridden, so bed riddled and bed ridden. Um, I know bed riddled isn't really a word, but like riddled with lice or whatever. Yep. I reckon they are related. Okay. I reckon they are a divergent thing that kind of was talking about a similar thing to be- yeah. To be sort of under the um, unwanted impact of in some way, mm-hmm. okay. um, and I think rid um, and riddance are unrelated. Oh, uh, interesting. So there's, there's a fifth Hedwig. Hed, sorry, Hedwig. Sorry. Yeah. Riddance. Riddle, like what Gollum does yep. to Bilbo. Yep. Okay, well, I'm going to keep it to the three. Rid, ridden, and riddled. So, uh, what do you think, Hedvig, out of those three? Um, Yeah, I'm on the same path, I think, as as Ben was, if I don't mistake. Uh, So that bedridden and riddled with fleas seem Mm -hmm. related. And get rid of something seems different. Because both bedridden and riddled with is like something towards, Mm -hmm. sort of. 
uh, you are ridden with the bed, you're ridden with fleas, whereas get rid of is to remove yep. something. And that seems very yep. different. Yep, yep. Um, so I think it's A and C that are related. And then I think I don't know what to do about my horse riding and my no. uh, riddle riddles. Uh, I don't know. I have no idea. If you had to tie that to one, which would it be? Which one's related to ride? I think bedridden I would tie to horse ridden. Interesting. I also think, is there something with like nightmares? That's like a person who rides you, right? Mm. And they're nightmares. Oh. Maybe. Okay. Well, we've got our answers. Doug, what you got? Do you know this one? I pr I'm pretty sure that the riddle that means fill with holes is from a different root, and it's related to the sieve words, sieve words in Latin and Greek, cribum oh, okay. and so forth. So I'm going to write that one off. And the other two, they are related, and I had to look this up. I was pretty sure. With these sort of looks like a past participle adjective, but you somehow find it's flipped from the sense you expect the verb to go in, you know, to be to be hag ridden, to be priest ridden is to have them on you. But in bed, you're on the bed. Hmm. But there, there was, uh, there was, and there, there was a lot of that. This is an old belief that that you know a nightmare is is is, is a hag rider. There was in old English yes. a noun, <laughs> a woman. Okay, yeah, but even <laughs> further back than that, I, that's what I was thinking it was going to be. But even further back than that, in old English, there is a noun, bed rider, a guy who's stuck in bed. Right. Is right in that bed. There's no verb, but from that, you they back constructed or, or got an adjective. So a bed rider is, he, that guy is bedridden. He's got bed rider. You know, he's, it's, it's not coming in the usual path. So it has a reversed sense from what, fascinating, what you'd expect. The other ones, hag ridden comes from being ridden by a hag. Yeah. That's what they used to call sleep paralysis. Right. Right. When your brain was awake, but your body couldn't move. So the answer is rid, ridden, and riddled are all unrelated, but ridden and ride are related. So yeah, the ridden, the ridden and ride is. It looks like the past participle of ride. It's yep. identical to it, but it's not actually etymologically that. But no. it, it is. Yeah. So Hedvig pretty much got everything, everything, everything correct. No, you didn't. Because I said that. Bedridden and riddled with holes were related. Yeah, 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 yeah. She made the same mistake as me. Oh, okay. Teacher, okay. teacher, I got it wrong. Thank you for your honesty. And I'm so impressed that you managed to connect ride with ridden because I had not made that connection. Yes, a riddle was a coarse sieve, and the notion of bullet riddled meant making somebody look like a riddle. Ridden is from ride. A horse that has been ridden has also been broken in. And if you are guilt ridden, it's been riding you. And then rid is from a totally different word from ridan, something like to clear land. Wait, wait, wait. Or something wait. Like you that. just said that bullet ridden makes you look like a riddle. Yeah. You said that as if that was a normal sentence. <laughs> because before that, he said a riddle is like a sieve, like it's a different word for sieve. A colander. Oh, I blocked that out because I always struggle with sieve. Oh, right. Because it doesn't look right. <laughs> Should be it's sieve. sieve. It doesn't look right. Sieve. Colander. A pasta strainer. I like to put a colander on my head and say, I'm under a terrific strain. Oh, <laughs> no. Dad joke. Dad joke. Thank you to everybody who's been giving us these related or nots. And thanks, Doug, for your expertise. That was a lot of fun. And I enjoyed playing that with you. And who better to play it with than Douglas Harper of Adam Online? Literally no one. Literally no one better to play it with. There's, there's <laughs> nothing here. Shall we get to a question more or two? Because there are some etymological things going on. Yes, please. This one's from Alistair via email. Hello at becauselanguage.com. Hi, Daniel. Love your show. Thank you. Could you please produce it more often? <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> Daniel, you're not allowed you're not allowed to write things into people's questions. That's that's not okay. It's a Dorothy Dixer. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, this one's going to take us to some strange places. I need your linguistic help, please, says Alistair. I have been contemplating Charon. The ferryman of uh, Greek mythology. Who the would, River Styx. Yeah, who would take dead souls to Hades, I believe. That's the one. He says, I have been contemplating Charon without fixing a price. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 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 sorry. Is this person saying that they've considered dying? I don't, I don't understand how you contemplate Charon. <laughs> right. It's okay to just think about Karen. That's not necessarily a worrying sign. I, I think about okay. This is this is like the Roman Empire thing. Sometimes you just think about like random bits of Greek mythology. 
And I love a good Dipergian reference, and that's obviously from Chris de Burks. Anyway, mm -hmm. when you cross his river, it is described as Stygian. Oh, not not mm. Styxian. Not Styxian. Are there any other examples where the adjectival X becomes a G? Should we not describe cyclists as Latagian or Keanu Reeves fans as Metrigian? Or this alteration as Suffigian, many thanks, Alistair. I don't know if people listening to this will understand that each of those words, if you backtrace it and put an X where the G is, are, li re are respectively latex, matrix, and suffix. Thank you, Ben. Right. Yay. Also, because I live in a place where most cyclists are not the latex kind. <laughs> yeah. But you um, did live in Australia. So, and not only that, you lived in I have Canberra. Seen them. So you had... And they terrified me. <laughs> I'm they, sorry. Because they come up behind you and they say, on your left. And I'm like, what the fuck was talking to me? I'm biking to work. Fuck off. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, cyclists who wear latex could be let latexians and latigians. Keanu Reeves fans, Keanu Reeves started in Matrix, could be matrixians or matrigians. And uh, all of these things are suffixes. Uh, so are they suffigian or suffixal? Yes. So why does the X turn to a G in some places and not others is the question. Okay. Well, Doug, help us out here. Ah, uh, you're on your own. This is uh, no, this is Greek grammar. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to think of other examples. Uh, I couldn't where but I, I think it's so I I ha I'm trying to reach for my Greek lexicon without unplugging the mic, but I think I can think of a reverse ish version of this, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I know they're out there. I just can't think of one. The only one I can think of is if you are someone's patron, you are giving them mm. patronage, but you can mm -hmm. be described as patrician. Well, that's interesting. That's Latin, yeah. but yes. I'm looking at, at, at in the Greek though that the, the, they have words that end in X, and I'm trying to figure out how you would do the, the you know the the. The related the form of that, like, and it's just you know, this is going to be one of the things that Latin did to Greek, like how, how Odysseus <laughs> comes out, Ulysses, it screws Greek up badly. Latin treats Greek the way French treats Latin. <laughs> okay, well, I remember from my schoolboy Latin that reg was this underlying form for king, and if it was just in its normal nominative form, then it was rex. <gasps> Re but regis, yeah. and that's why we get regal. And I remember that we had a thing about law being lex, the word turning into legal. There okay. was also a legal loyal so thing a going on. There's a little bit of precedent well, here, X to G. Yeah, so- We should also point out maybe that the uh, X is sort of two sounds in one, right? It's a K and an S sound. And the K sound is actually produced in the same place in the mouth as the G sound. Oh. That's it. So they're very close to each other. The only difference between them is whether your vocal folds are vibrating at the same time or not. So you can often see uh, switches between sounds that are in the same place in the mouth. But so this is the same as uh, t and d and f and v. They can often flip between each other mm -hmm. depending on its context. So the sound that comes after k is uh, in rex is an s, which is also what's called unvoiced. So your vocal folds are not vibrating. Maybe if that gets flipped, so you have something else, like you said you wanted to put al, so rexal. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe what happens then is that the a, uh, because that's voiced, maybe makes the ka voiced. It's a little simpler. What's happening is the underlying form is reg. And if you put an s on it, like you're supposed to for a nominative singular, it becomes <laughs> regs, which sounds like rex, close enough. And then... You can take the reg and you can do other things with it in different forms, regis, regal, and so on. Hey, I finally got a hold of Little and Scott, and actually the uh, adjectival form in Greek is stigios. It does have a G. Yeah, so there we go. So it's the other way around. So it's the yeah, it's S the that is making the, the gut yeah. sound. The X cut. to the noun, and it, it, they drop that. Right. But probably for the sound things you were describing, it, it would have been yeah. more euphonious to do that. Yeah. The g is assimilating to the s and becoming unvoiced k for you linguists who know what that is. So, so for for the benefit of our listeners, really quickly, um, to to answer the question for Alistair, we've got the wrong idea, and it was never the river Styx; it was the river Stigs. 
probably. And then people got sick of sit, like being like, well, that's dumb. Like, cause that sounds <laughs> bad. Let's, let's just call it the river sticks uh, with an X. And so the X versions are just people probably starting out by going GS and then being like, it's, okay, it's yeah. just a total waste of time. What are yeah, we, what are we doing like here, folks? And then it's yeah. just a bunch of X's came about. You got it. Okay, last one from Pharaoh Cat. So I have been wondering a thing. I learned that the Auslan word for why and because are the same. Whoa. Mm -hmm. With a slight variation. Why? Because mm -hmm. black. <laughs> that could make for mm -hmm. some really good teenage sign. Why? Because. Because. Yeah. You get the sign why and you just hand it right back. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I don't know if that's the um, high school teacher in me feeling it real hard, but yeah, that's that's what it read to me. Why? Why? <laughs> well, this is also true for spoken Spanish. Por qué? Por qué? Mm -hmm. And I suspect other Romance languages as well. Are there other languages mm -hmm. in non-Romance families where why and because are the same or almost the same? And why does that happen? Does anyone want to try this one? Because I did a little bit of work on this. I think there are other languages where that's the case. And... I think that, um, so like in Swedish, you can say that it's why is varför and because is därför. So it's actually where and there, <laughs> where, wherefore and therefore, which mm -hmm. you actually get in Old English, if I'm not mistaken as well. Therefore, we should plant seeds, yeah, okay. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the thing you uh, that's good to think about with things like this is if they're doing a similar job, but they occur in very different contexts. So... Why will always be in questions at the beginning, um, and because will not be at the beginning in questions. So right, you can right, right, afford right. to have them be similar because you have enough other things around to tell you which one it is. So my suspicion is, I don't know, I know, I think there are some other languages that do this, but it's kind of a cheap way to do things because you have enough stuff around you probably to tell you which one it is. Yeah, I took a look at a translation page on the web which had like a hundred different languages, how they say why and how they say because, just to see if lots of them mm -hmm. were the same. Lots of them were the same, and I was kind of limited to ones in writing systems that I could parse. Like in Aymara, the word for both of them is kunata. In Chichua, the word for both is chufukwa. There are lots of languages, like there are about 12 where it's pretty much the same word, and it makes sense that it would be the same word because what you're doing is you're saying reason what, reason that. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So there's not tons of languages, but there are quite a few, and I think we've uncovered why they would be the same. They happen in close proximity to each other, they're interlocking pairs, and they're just two different halves of the same question. And I guess the somewhat more interesting question might be why does why and because sound so very different for us? Mm-hmm, yeah. What's behind because? Yeah, why don't you keep saying wherefore and therefore? Because like you have like wherefore art thou Romeo, right? Yeah. Yep. Meaning why are you Romeo? And you have therefore we should do this. Mm -hmm. So why did you guys start saying why and because? Yeah, they're very different. They sound <laughs> very different. Doug, do you have any insight on because? I mean, it seems to make sense, right? Cause, the cause is this. What's the B? By the cause of. It happens by the cause of this. So it's by cause? It's not B. It's it's by. It's been leveled oh. down to B, but it's by cause. By that. And, and it used to be in, in Middle English and later it was very common. You still will say because of this, but it sounds like an extra word and editors knock it out. But it was very common to say because that, because of, because why. Because why was, was a... You know, you find that in old text. And, uh, you know, like, how come? We say how come when we mean why. What is it? I think it's in a way it's just a fuller way to say why. Why is a, an important question, but it's a small word. Because, you know, why? Because one is the question, one is the answer. Why? Because. Why? Because. They start to roll around with each other and get tangled up in each other. Huh. You know, the, the why of something is the because of something. I mean, in, in casual speech, they're not. It's the question and the answer together. Yeah, and they, they get rolled up. But wait, where did why come from? That's the okay, that's the old English. I mean, it's what did someone said. Poor quite doesn't that have why in it? That's like the the K is the why, right? It's the it's the what? Yeah, for what? Yeah, mm -hmm. and the what? Yeah, for what? Um, it's it's a locative form of that root for all the relative and pr other pronouns. Yep. Well, 
Thanks, Veracat, for that question. I feel like we've done a great job on those. And thanks, Doug, for helping us. Let's just have one comment from Elliot. Remember last time Elliot asked us about salt and salary? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we all tried to say at the same time what we thought the folk etymology was. Doug, break in if you want to correct me here, but he suggested salt and salary. We know that Roman soldiers weren't really paid in salt, correct? Well, you know, you're talking about a real long swath of history there and a whole lot of different ways that the Romans got things done. So it's hard to make a general statement, but the old statement that this word is because that policy doesn't seem to have much ancient lineage to it. It seems to be the scholars came to that conclusion. And we've all accepted it since because it looks right. But the the historical evidence is apparently wanting. Okay. Well, Ben thought that that meant that the whole thing was wrong. But my thinking was maybe the fact is wrong about the salt, but they still had to buy salt. So the etymology itself was so. It could be an image that that we've let the Romans had and we've lost. This is the salt in your, you know, it was the the salt of life or something. It's it's, it's the extra. It could be something we don't have access to in their heads. Always remember that that exists. But money is famously like really prolific for metaphors. Like we were talking in that episode about dough, right? Yeah, that's right. You can say, have you got any dough? Meaning, have you got any money? Um, and you can do things like the, the obvious ones, like Benjamins in Eng- American English, because like, <laughs> yeah, you have right. Benjamin Franklin on the money. In Swedish, you can do things like lux, meaning salmon, uh, or pop, <laughs> meaning paper. In some languages, it's furs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> lux is a thousand kroner. Yeah. But we suspected that Elliot was pulling the old Machiavellian super sneaky double cross to get Ben to reject the entire etymology, but it was also possible that he didn't intend anything. And I suspect that he absolutely did. (laughs) Elliot says, chiming in since you asked about related or not, super Machiavellian. (laughs) And I believe I said in that episode, if that's the case, I'm going to doff my hat, sir. And I, I stand by that. That was an, do you know what? We should get Elliot to play against Hedvig during board games because then her sociopathy and his sociopathy can like (laughs) duke it out across the table. Elliot specifically says, I had Ben in mind while thinking up a good red herring. (laughs) Sorry, not sorry, Ben. So much for our new game, Machiavellian or not. Oh, that's so funny. I kind of like it more. Now, maybe I'm just an egoist. I don't know. But like the fact that it was targeted at me and I fell for it. Oh, it's <laughs> that's so good. Line okay. and sinker. Yep, that's it. Here's a game you could do. Have everyone think of the most implausible possible etymology for something, which is what I do when I first see a word. I try, I'm i sitting here thinking, <laughs> salary. Okay. It's like a salt lick that they use to lure deer out of the woods to kill them. This is how you get the soldiers to sign up. You offer them money. It's the salt that brings them to the slaughter. Maybe it was vegetables. Everyone could make right. their salad when they got home. Celery. <laughs> right. Right. Yes. With celery, even. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you ignore the past, everything's easy. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the tagline for the show. <laughs> Big thanks to everyone who gave suggestions for this episode, for speech docs who transcribe all the words, patrons who keep the show going, and our very special guest, Douglas Harper of Edom Online. Doug, thank you so much for coming and showing us the true path. My pleasure. We are not worthy. Oh, stop it. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, if you like the show, here's some stuff you can do that would help the show out. You can follow us. We are at Because Lang Pod just about everywhere, including a bunch of places you probably wouldn't expect. So have fun on that particular scavenger hunt. Uh, you can send us ideas, ideally through SpeakPipe, so that we can play your sweet oaky timbers in the podcast. But you can also just email us at hello at becauselanguage.com. And as always, you can just tell a mate about this great show for word nerds. Oh, and write a review, which is like telling a friend that you haven't met yet. That's a nice thing to do. Oh, that's very sweet. I like that. And also, if you write a a review, we might also read out what you say uh, at the end of the show. And you can also support us by becoming a supporter on Patreon. Become a patron. Uh, We can do a lot of things with your money. We can uh, give some money to our guests. We can spend it on people who transcribe our episodes. And you also get some bonus things. You get bonus episodes, of course, as most Patreon listeners, if you get to the level above. Which level is the first one that you get episodes at? The listener level. The listener level. 
Uh, you can also uh, follow people on Patreon for free. You get fewer things, but it can set you up to you get little notifications and stuff. That can be fun. You get live episodes as well. And I'm thinking maybe we should do a live episode where we play code names online. Yes. Because that's really, yes. I can read, huh. you can do that online. And that's pretty fun and easy. And you also get fun mail outs. One of them is being prepared in Daniel's house as we speak, I believe. Shout outs and access to our Discord community where you can suggest things to us and see a bit of how the planning goes on. Basically, whenever I find something fun, I post it to show ideas. So you can get a sneak peek of a material that may or may not go into the show, depending on Daniel's filtering. <coughs> and as always, at the end of the show, we give a shout out to patrons who are supporting us at the supporter level. And Daniel has been thinking of new, clever ways of ordering people's names. Because for a while, we just had them in the same order. And then someone said, could you spice it up? And Daniel has gotten very spicy with it. Very spicy. This time, we're ordering our supporters alphabetically. But after you run the names through the Enigma machine. So the Enigma machine is what people used in World War II to send coded messages. Germany, specifically. And you have to set a certain preset word. So what word did you use? Well, you have three rings, and I decided to set the position to B and the ring to L. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Because language. And the rotors are number six, one, and three. All right, take it away. All right, so if you do that, and you then order them based on that, you get this order. Nasrin, Christopher, Cheyenne, Andy from Logophilius, Elissa, Kathy... Margaret, Joanna, Roger, Kenny Archer, Meredith, Jack, Tony, Kevin, Angry Balls, John, John Troy, Troy, Kate, Manu, James, Renee, Sonic Snedgehog, Feral Cat, Whitney, Nikolai, Chris L, Brianne, Raina, Helen, Larry, Colleen, Tag, Aria Flame, Amy, Matt, Sam, Steel, Molly D, Diego, Elias, Stan, Lord, Lord Mortis, Mortis. Termi. Wolfdog, Andy, Lissa, Amir, Aisha, 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 Ecutema, <laughs> Nigel, Aldo, <laughs> Felicity, Grammary, N, Ignacio, Luis, oh, Otim, Tim. Raj, Chris W, and Keith. And I was trying desperately to figure out how the Enigma machine worked when I was doing this, but I cannot figure it out. Well, to be fair, Hedvig, I like, like, top top, top minds for years were trying to crack that code, so it would have been pretty fucking amazing if you managed to do it in, like, 30 seconds. I was trying when I was going. I was like, oh, I get an A and an A, and then I got a K. And I was no, like, yeah. Oh, the, well, Don't even mind. look for patterns there. Anyway, please continue. <laughs> we also have a special a shout-out to our newest patron at the list level, uh, who are Debbie and Jane from Space, and we also have a bunch of people who have followed us uh, on the free level on Patreon. Those are Gia, Rayleigh, Obasterfield, Don, Hanny, Human. It's nice to know there's always one mm -hmm. of them. Polly, Alan, Rarison, Jonathan, Timothy, Krish, and the Irish Litter Times. As you do. Thank you to all of you. The Irish Literary Times? Our wow. theme music was written and performed by Drew Kriplianov, who also performs with Ryan Bino and Didion's Bible. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Because language. Pew, pew, pew. Pew, pew, pew. Doug, thank it's you right. so much for hanging out with us. No, yeah, it was fun. I think what you said earlier was very interesting, Doug, where you said that, like, what you tried to do instead of being the final arbiter is, like, point to a source and say, this word comes from that thing. And I think, as far as I know from other people who have projects as large as yours, which, like, I know uh, it's not as large, but, like, Harald Hammerstrom maintains glottolog.com. And I've talked to, uh, he escapes my name right now, the guy who does uh, Omniglot. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, I know. The easiest way to keep your sanity in any project like this is think of a very good decision-making process. And if one of them is, I'm going to point you to sources and list the different ones, and then you can, you know, make up your mind to somewhat or, or get access to them. Because you can't decide <laughs> the etymology for all these. You can't do your own research for all of these. It would drive you mad uh you you wouldn't be able to function um so i think that's very very smart thank you uh, this is just a carryover from my newspaper work where i have to explain the world to people but i didn't see it and i wasn't involved in it but here's what i think is happening you know it's 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 a natural thing but when i first started there was nothing online it was really just the online version of what you could go get in books but it's changed because the online has changed since then. But yeah. this is great. You guys are doing, you know, I wanted to say, you were talking about the, 
we were talking about toast before. Oh yeah. And I went and asked my co the, my co researcher Tally Felix, who does like, deep dives and and. <laughs> She's the greatest researcher. I said, you did toast last. What do you remember that I can tell these guys if they ask about it? And she's like, well, I just, it's all, it all came down to what, you know, why do you raise a glass and call that a toast? There's a long story and it's not the story you think it is. But at one point she is making toast in her kitchen, cutting it up and dropping it in beer and drinking it to see <laughs> what effect it has on the temperature. And like, this is research. <laughs> that is how it's done. I'm like, this, if there was a the Nobel real Prize, that's the nerd yeah, stuff. That's how you research. And it involves beer, so that's yes. automatically right. good. I made a mental note never to suggest that she researched trepanning. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Or heroin. Right, right. <laughs>